We have a guest speaker, Brother Kevin Pendergrass. He's from the McClish Avenue Church of Christ in Ardmore, Oklahoma. He works with a program called The Gospel of Christ. Uh, in fact, he's recently been uh, put in director of that program. A graduate of East Tennessee School of Preaching, comes from a good Christian family, raised in the large church, and uh, I'll let him tell you anything else that he wants to about himself. I'm not going to say anything about the work because that's what he's here to tell you about. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you and we thank you so much for your grace and love and blessings through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so blessed, Father, to be a part of your kingdom, a part of your church, and we're grateful for the privilege of being so and grateful that you ordained it for us and brought it to this earth and help help us father as citizens of your kingdom to take our responsibility seriously and our citizenship uh, seriously knowing that it is a great privilege and even though we live in a great country that uh, we pray for and we pray father that uh, the leaders of our country continue to uh, bless us with open meetings and open services we pray, Father, that you watch over them and help them and give guidance to them. But we know that we are in a greater kingdom, a kingdom that is an eternal kingdom. And so we're grateful to that, to you, Father, for all you've done for us. And we pray especially that, <coughs> excuse me, that you be with Kevin this morning as he speaks to us and talks about the work that uh, they are doing in your church. Thank you, Father, for all the people who are faithful and loving and care and workers in your kingdom. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So I'll let Kevin get started. I won't take up any more of his time. Good morning. Certainly good to see everybody out. Woo, that is loud. I'm whispering right now. I was at a congregation one time, and it was probably a room about a quarter of this size. And there was about 30 people in there, and before we got started, a fellow came up to me, and he said, you need to put this on, there's some people in here who can't hear. I said, I, I, said, I don't think I need that. I said, it's going to be fine. He said, no, he said, he said, you really, really need to put this on. So I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and put it on. Make them happy, you know, I'm there to get money, so I definitely don't want to make anybody mad. So, uh, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> so I go ahead and I put the microphone on, and uh, but I never turn it on. And I would go through the whole class, and of course everybody could hear me. It's a very small room. After it was over, he came up and he nudged me. He said, aren't you glad you put it on? So I, I'm very loud. I know I'm very loud. Uh, I want to be very loud. If I'm too loud, you can always close your ears. That's all right. Um, the reason I am very loud is, number one, it's the way I was born. I've always been loud as a speaker. And also, I want to make sure everybody can hear. I would rather somebody hear too loud than not hear at all. And I've had a lot of uh, people who can hear thank me for that. So uh, I've always told people that's why I speak a little loud. That's just kind of my natural voice anyway. If you don't believe me, you can uh, ask the Willises. I, I had a good time with them last night, and I talked their ears off, and I spoke just like I probably am going to as loud this morning. But it is good to be here. My name is Kevin Pinnagrass. I work with the McClish Avenue Church of Christ in Ardmore, Oklahoma. I work specifically with an evangelistic work known as the Gospel of Christ. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with that work? All right? So good. Three. Three people. Four people. Um, that's good, though, because I like going to congregations where there are not a whole lot of people familiar with our program so that we can let you know about it and that you can start to benefit from our program. Now, before I really get into it, I, I want to go ahead and put a disclaimer on this so you don't immediately shut your ears off because somebody who's with the mission work is coming. I know growing up, when I heard that there was some report going to be given or that when somebody was going to come and talk about a mission work, uh, usually it wasn't very interesting. I'm just being honest here. That's what I you know, got out of it when I was growing up. It really didn't interest me. A lot of times people thought, oh, no, smile. Somebody's going to talk about a work, you know, they're going to show some people, pictures of people who are baptized, you know, not really get anything out of it. So what I want to hopefully do is not only tell you about our work, but I want to uh, hopefully preach and teach and encourage you as we're talking about this program. So that you can get excited about evangelism and you can 
get also excited about what we're doing and uh, possibly become a part of that. Now, the work is overseen by the elders of the Clish Avenue Church of Christ. It's been in operation for about 15 years, and our goal is to take the whole gospel and to take it to the whole world. That's why we exist. That's why we are there. We want to take the whole gospel, and we want to take it to the whole world. Now, when I say whole gospel, obviously that would be opposed to what? Anything, anything other than the whole gospel. Part of it or even the majority of it. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. When you look at denominational speakers and preachers today, and if you were to observe some of them, if you ever have, a lot of what they are saying, is it true or is it false? I mean, a lot of what they're saying. We would say it's pretty much true. They believe in God. That's true. He exists. Genesis is one. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's true. John 3, 16. They believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. That's true. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So a lot of what they are saying, it is true. But how much false doctrine does it take to be a false teacher? Now, the answer is not very much. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, you'll see that Adam and Eve, they were given the command to not eat from the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could eat from any tree they wanted to, but they were not to eat from that tree. Well, here comes Satan, and Satan comes along in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, and he says that you can eat from any tree. In fact, God said if you do, you will or shall surely die. Satan says if you do, then you shall not surely die. Only one word was changed in that. But it changed everything. And so it doesn't take a whole lot of false doctrine to be a false teacher. In fact, one word or one thing can cause you to be a false teacher. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, the reason I took you to this passage is to show you the importance that the Bible places on not dodging any issues and teaching the whole truth. Paul here had been in Ephesus for several years. He was leaving them. He was giving what we commonly describe as his farewell speech. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, he says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul said, not only did I teach you publicly, but I also did what? I taught you from house to house. There was nothing more I could have given you. There was nothing that I held back when I was teaching you. When we continue reading in this context, we come to verse 27. Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the what? The whole counsel of God. We have to teach and preach the whole truth. Now, is it going to offend people at times? Yes, it is. But we have to do it anyway. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Paul was familiar with this. He said, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Oftentimes, we are going to offend people because we are a light shining in a world of darkness. Christ being the greatest light of all, and what did they do to him? They crucified him. What did he do wrong? Absolutely nothing. It was the fact that he was light. The world is darkness, and when we put that light on darkness, either they will convert and come over, or they will absolutely hate our guts, literally. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, is Jesus was teaching the disciples and the apostles about the limited commission. He said that as you go out, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. I always make the point that that was a limited commission. We've got a whole lot more people to hate us today in the great commission. So we can, and we will be hated. I don't know where we got this idea that we are supposed to have everybody to like us. Brother, that's never found anywhere in the Holy Writ of God's Word. In fact, the exact opposite is found. Now, should we want to go out just to make enemies? No, I'm not saying that. But we are going to make enemies when we do teach and when we do preach. We need to go ahead and accept that idea. Oftentimes, people claim that they are searching for truth or they're looking for truth. But in reality, they are not. Um, let me tell you a story. When I was about 17, 18, 19, somewhere around there, I think I was around 18 or 19, is when I first started preaching. It was for a small country congregation. A good crowd for us was about 30. It was an hour away from where I lived because I was born and raised in Alabama, God's country. And uh, in Tennessee, about an hour, that's where I was preaching, about an hour down the road in Tennessee. So we would always uh, talk about the sermon on the way back. So my family, they would always come with me. And when I would go out there and preach, they'd always support me. So there was one particular Sunday that I had preached. Let me tell you, this is the best sermon that had ever been preached, ever. I 
I mean, not just by me. This is like the best sermon that had ever been preached by mankind, or ever will be. Will be. I mean, I, that was just it. It was awesome. And I knew it was that good. So I felt very good about this sermon. And on the way home, I told Mom, I said, Mom, what'd you think? I had my head held high because it was good. It was good. And I said, tell me the truth. That's what I said after. I said, tell me the truth. I wish I wouldn't have said that. Because <laughs> that's exactly what she proceeded to do. She said, well, you could have done this there. You could have done that. I said, well, what was it? What were you talking about? That's a good sermon. That's the best sermon. She said, honey, you said tell you the truth. See, oftentimes when people say tell me the truth, what they really mean is tell me everything's okay. Tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm fine. And then if you disagree, all of a sudden, like, wait a minute now. No, no, no. What they meant is just tell me everything's okay. They didn't really mean tell me the truth. We've got to tell people the truth. That's the whole point I'm trying to get out of Acts chapter 20. That's the whole point that I'm making is we've got to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. I want you to turn me in your Bible to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 5 and while we don't live under the Old Testament, I understand that. We were never a part of the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, that was the defense of Israel. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, Christ has taken the old law out of the way and established the new as being authoritative. I understand that. But the Old Testament, we can learn certain principles about God. We can learn certain principles about how, how he deal, dealt with his uh, people. We can learn about the people at that time. And in Jeremiah chapter 5, we see something that is very common today. Verse 30 and 31 is the verses I want us to read. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. The Bible says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Now, first of all, it's bad enough that you have false prophets prophesying things that aren't true. But you know, false teachers, that, that's always been around and always will be around. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says that there have always been false teachers and there will be false teachers among you. So we understand, yes, this is bad, this is terrible, there's false teachers. But what really makes this scenario bad is that what are God's people doing about it? Verse 31, my people hate it and they stand against it and they do not tolerate it. Well, I wish that's what verse 31 said, but that's not what it says. Verse 31 says that my people what? My people love to have it so. Here you have this false doctrine being taught by these false prophets. And on top of that, God's people love to have it that way. God's people love to have it so. I want to ask you, why would God's people want to hear false doctrine? Why would God's people want to hear something? That is not true. Well, we continue reading in the context, and we come to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. And the answer lies within this verse, because the Bible says, They, talking about the false prophets, have also healed the hurt of my people slightly. Some translations say superficially, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. What does that mean? Peace, peace. When there is no peace. Well, it means when somebody tells you everything is okay when in reality it's not. You're living in adultery. All right, that's okay. I want to tell you everything's okay. Even though I know it's not. Even though Matthew 19, 9 is very clear. 1 Corinthians 6 is very clear. I, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And by the way, God's a God of grace. So maybe he'll, he's just going to go ahead and accept that. I don't want to have to tell you to change. And so on and so forth. The scenarios go, go on. When it comes to people preaching peace, peace, when there is no peace. We understand this from a, a secular world. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. In fact, we wouldn't want somebody in the secular world to tell us peace, peace, when there is no peace. Let me give you an illustration. You've been feeling sick. So you decide I'm going to go to the doctor. You go to the doctor. Say, doctor, I think I may have some, um, some symptoms of, of possibly even having cancer. I'm not sure. But these are some symptoms and I want you to check me out. So the doctor checks you out and he draws some blood, says that I'll call you back in a couple weeks. Well, during that time period, he gets the results back and sure enough, you do have cancer. So he makes to himself, I don't want to tell Kevin that he has cancer. He's a young man. He's, he, he, 
he's going to ruin his life, and, uh, you know, his, his day, his week, his month, and affect his family. I don't, I don't want to have to tell him this. So he calls me up and he says, Kevin, I got wonderful news. You don't have cancer. Now, for a short period of time, what is that going to do? It's going to relieve me. I'm going to feel happy. I'm going to be glad that I don't have cancer. But if I don't realize that I do have cancer and do something about that, what's that cancer eventually going to do to me? It's going to kill me. Now, how many of you would want a doctor like that? We may call him something like Dr. Pepper if, if there was a doctor operating like that. We understand that nobody would want a doctor like that. As bad as that news is, I would want somebody to tell me as soon as possible so I can do something about that, right? But how come we're not like that when it comes to sin? How can we want our preachers to tell us everything is okay? How can we want our eldership to tell us everything's okay? How can we want our Christian friends to tell us everything's okay when they know it's not? Why is that? Well, we want that temporary satisfaction. But you see, that's not going to last. That's why it's temporary. It may feel good for a short period of time. But I will also say this. I would much rather have a doctor tell me that I don't have cancer and me die of cancer when I really did than have a... Christian friends tell me that I'm okay when I'm really not and I die in my sin. So we've got to understand the, the importance of teaching and preaching the truth. This isn't a game. This isn't something that is, is a hobby. This is something that is our life as Christians. Well, let me take that back. It should be our life as Christians to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. And so that's what we do. That's what we do. Uh, and the reason why I spend so much time on that is because if we're not doing that, then our work does not need to be in existence. If we're not willing to teach and preach the whole counsel of God, if we're that cowardly, then we don't need to be doing what we're doing. But we are doing what we're doing, and we are teaching and preaching the whole counsel of God. And it's important to us that you know that. It's important to us as a work that you understand this is where we stand. We don't preach different ways when we go to different places. We're going to preach the truth. We're going to preach the whole counsel of God. We're not going to beat around the bush. And if it offends somebody, so be it. But if it's what God says, that's where we're going to stand, and we're not going to apologize for it. Because that's what the Bible says, and that's what's going to save mankind. John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So that's what we do. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. We have, in essence, several different methods. The first method is through TV. We spread the gospel through TV. But we are much more than a TV program. And we want people to understand that. That while we preach on TV, we're not just a TV ministry. That is one of the things that we do as a work. We also do radio. We also have a wonderful website. A website has been viewed literally by every single country in the world. It's not an exaggeration. That's how far reached our website goes out. We have millions of kids every single year on our website. The great thing about our website is everything on there is free. You can go on there. You can watch our lessons. You can listen to our lessons. We have Bible crossword puzzles. We have Bible quizzes on there. We have Bible transcripts. We have Bible qu uh, quizzes. We have correspondence material that people can use. We have Spanish material on our website. And all of that is free of charge. You can go online 24-7 and you can have access to everything that we have. In fact, you can even burn your own DVD or CD and make it yourself. If you like some of the videos on there, you can have them and put them on DVD or CD. You have permission to do that. I was at a congregation one time and I talked about burning DVDs and CDs. Y'all can probably remember this is going. And there was a woman in the back, and after it was over, she came up and she said, She said, Kevin, I really love your lessons. Thank you. She said, But one thing I just didn't understand. I could tell that she was really troubled. This is a true story. I said, What? Well, what is it? You know, what did I do wrong? She said, uh, Well, she said, Why would I want to burn any of your material? And, uh, and she was being dead serious, too. This, this isn't a joke. This really happened. And I told her, I said, no, no, no. I said, well, I'm not talking about taking a match or lighter or burning it, but I'm talking about transferring that material. And so you do have the, uh, the capability to do that, to make your own DVDs and your CDs on our, on our website. And that continues to grow. All the services that we have on our website continues to grow. Every week we add a new program on there. 
Uh, we also have some short YouTube videos. We're just now starting to incorporate over the past few months. We only have about three or four of the YouTube videos up, but um, we're, we're starting to try to get more interest in that market and uh, show more of a presence when it comes to YouTube and some of those things. Because a lot of times people might not sit down and watch a 30-minute lesson, but if you have a video six, seven, eight minutes, especially on a controversial issue, a lot of times people will sit down and they'll, they'll spend a few minutes and take the time to watch that. So we're starting to incorporate more, more of those types of videos as well. But something else that we're, we're doing besides all of that is we're starting to really incorporate uh, tent meetings and formal public debates. That's something else that we're really starting to, uh, to try to incorporate. Now, I want everybody to turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 17 with me. Acts chapter 17, verse 17. Because I know when I say tent meetings and formal debates, you probably think that I just throw you all on the time machine and we go back to the 1950s. No, we didn't. We're still here in 2012. I'm still 26. But we are incorporating, we are incorporating tent meetings and public debates. In fact, these have been very, very much effective in what we're trying to accomplish in our work. In Acts chapter 17, verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily, with those who happen to be there. We call this our synagogue and marketplace strategy. Because when you look at what they did in the first century church, what did they do? They, went, they evangelized, they got on the streets, they preached, they were preaching in public, and they would go into the synagogues, which would today be our modern-day denominational buildings, and they would go in there and they would reason with them from the scriptures. In fact, read Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 3 sometimes. That was the custom that Paul had. That he would go in and he would go in and what would he do? He would find out well, where are the false worshippers so we can go in there and we can teach them. Brethren, they had a vision and they had a focus on how to accomplish that vision and they were not afraid. When I think of fear, and, and I look at fear in the brotherhood today. And then I read scripture. Brethren, why do we have so much fear today? Most of the fear we have is something we've created for ourselves anyway. It's, it's not even a reality. It's something we've only created in our own mind. And, and I look at the idea of fear and how fear has kept us from doing so many things. These brethren that we read about, these early Christians in the first century, they were not afraid. They had faith in God. They had faith and trust in God, and they studied the Word of God. They were ready to go out. They were ready to go out and debate and defend the Word. Now, that's exactly what we're trying to incorporate more of. Well, Kevin, don't you know debates don't work? You know, Kevin's 26. We've got to teach him better. <laughs> you know, debates don't work, and bless his heart, he's got all this energy, and, and, and you know, he's, he's excited. And, but, you know, debates just don't work. We're going to have to calm Kevin down a little bit. Somebody's got to tell them this stuff doesn't work. We've been there. We've, we've tried it. It just doesn't work. Let me tell you something. It does work. And, I, and it does work very effectively. I wish I could tell you a lot of different stories of conversions that we've had. But I've seen more people convert in the past couple years in my life than I've ever seen converted. And it's not because of free ring circuses. It's not because of pizza parties. It's not because of trying to bring people in through entertainment. It's because of gospel preaching. That's the secret. Gospel preaching. Who would have thought? Just going to the Bible and preaching the word as actually what's going to convert people. And all this time we thought it was, uh, you know, having balloon bounces and bringing people in. Or having circuses. Or, or you know, maybe, maybe every now and then doing a few things unauthorized in the assembly. You know, that's going to bring young people in, Kevin. Don't you know better? Well, I'm a young person. I'm younger than most of you out there. So let me tell you, that's not what's going to bring young people in. What's going to bring young people in, middle-aged people in, old people in is the word of God. That's what's going to bring people in. If they're looking for it. Read Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. There were a lot of different grounds, but there was only one seed. And if that seed fell on good ground, it was going to produce every single time. I preached a gospel meeting last week, and one of the points I made is that if you're not looking for truth, then I'm not interested in wasting my time with you. Now I pray that one day you change, but we're so afraid of running people away. Brethren, I'm not afraid of running people away. I'm afraid of not running wrong people. I don't want people here that don't want to be here. I don't want people causing trouble who just want to cause trouble. I only want people here if they want to be here and if they're dedicated to the cause. In fact, read the whole New Testament. And what you see is a desire to do the right thing. 
If people have a desire to do the right thing, brother, that is when you're going to see conversions happen. When you see good hearts and good soil. Don't get mad at the seed or the seed thrower when it doesn't land on good soil. That's not the seed's fault. That's the soil's fault. Don't change the seed. Change the soil. We did a tent meeting back in May. And it was outside, obviously, under a pavilion. And we had a, a lake very close nearby. And the thing that's neat about these is you have permission to basically be as loud as you want. And nobody can do anything about it. We talked to the park ranger, and he said, you know, that they can leave if they want, but nobody can tell y'all to quiet down or to shut down. So we cranked up the speakers, and we preached. Well, there was a couple of individuals that were fishing, a man and his wife, and had a little uh, three-year-old boy, just come for a leisure time. They heard what was going on and thought, well, what, is, what in the world are they doing? So they came up to the tent. And, of course, we had signs that said all are welcome, tent meeting, gospel meeting, so people didn't think we were like a family reunion. <laughs> so they, uh, they came up, and they actually came in their car, and they just pulled up, and they rolled down the window. So they didn't actually come under. That's another benefit, by the way, of a tent meeting. A lot of times people just don't want to come in the doors. And so they rolled down their window, and they just kind of listened from afar, and we could tell they were out there. So then, next night, they did the same thing, rolled down the windows. Third night, they finally got out of their car, and they sat down, and we met them and talked to them. And, uh, actually, we met them the night before, too, and talked to them some. But this night, they actually came under, and we had a two-hour Bible study with them after the, the meeting. And by the way, uh, we preached. I say we preached. These weren't 20-minute, maybe, maybe less. We preached, I think the shortest of them was an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 10, something like that. So they got a whole lot of Bible while they were there just listening. So we had a two-hour Bible study with them afterwards. When there was a tornado warning in the area, by the way, they were wanting to study the Bible. And uh, I even told them, I said, hey, I said, there's a tornado warning. I said, well, what do you guys want to do? Of course, we were outside, and uh, I said, now, well, let's study. I said, okay, well, let's, let's move inside somewhere and study the Bible. And uh, so they did, you know. They didn't say, hey, we're scared. We want to go. They wanted to study right there, right there. Well, they came back the next night, and they were baptized the next night. Very faithful to this day. Uh, they're there every time the doors are open. In fact, uh, I talked to them not too long ago. And it was interesting what he said. I'll never forget. By the way, both of them are 24 years old. He said, uh, him and his wife both are 24. He said, you know, he said, we came to fish. Um, he said, and catch fish. But instead, we were the ones that got caught. That's actually what he said when he came up uh, from being baptized. That's just one story out of uh, hundreds I can tell But brethren uh, have the wrong mentality oftentimes on evangelism. We've forgotten about these things and getting out and working. When I do a door knocking campaign and we door knock a thousand houses and not a single person comes, that's a very successful door knocking campaign. You know why? Because we got out and we did what we were supposed to do. Oftentimes we're so resorts, uh, you know, we uh, look at only the, uh, what, what, are, what are the results? We're results oriented. And we shouldn't be that way. Because read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. That's, that's up to God and that's up to the individual. It's up to us to go out and to preach it and to teach it. And I will say this, when we do it and when we keep doing it, we're going to have we will if we keep doing it and if we keep doing it. Another uh, letter actually I want to read is, is from a, the last debate that I've had. I've had three formal debates. I've, the last debate I had was on the issue of mechanical instruments and worship. It was with a Pentecostal preacher. And it was a two-night debate in Arkansas. And um, it was a very good debate. I was very, very pleased with it. And I got this uh, letter from... A now faithful member of the body of Christ. And this is what he said. I'm just going to read a snippet of it. He said, it was, a through, it was through a debate much like this one with a member of the Church of Christ that I and my wife and most of my former church members found the truth and are now faithful members of the Lord's Church. Now this is a former Pentecostal preacher and an ordained bishop. Former. And that's the kind of letter he wrote. Now, somebody in the church is writing and telling him the debates don't work anymore. <laughs> he didn't get the memo apparently. He didn't, he didn't get it. Somebody's telling him, come on, former Pentecostal preacher, don't you know the faith don't work? Don't tell me you got converted through the faith like that. Because the faith just don't work anymore. Of course, I'm being sarcastic to prove the point, but yes, they do. If you have the right souls listening, if you have the right individuals listening, they do work if you're preaching the truth. And one thing I like about the debates is you're going to get in front of an audience that more than likely you could never ever get in front of. Because when you have a debate, it's not just you preaching what you believe. But you're being examined according to what you believe. 
And you see, everybody likes to see that. Everybody likes to think. Because whether you even care about the issue or not, you can say, okay, I want to look at these two guys who believe different things and see what they have to say. See which argumentation holds up. And through debates, I can't tell you through the tent meetings how many denominational preachers have been converted. I believe five throughout the past few years that I know of have been converted. Five denominational preachers. These are not just members. These are preachers. That former Pentecostal preacher that I just read, uh, you a little snippet about, what's interesting about him is he was converted uh, by a former by a member of the church who used to be a Baptist preacher who was converted through a debate. Now think about that. Think about that line there of so many people who are being converted. We're out and we're working and we believe in what we're doing. We know that this stuff works and we go out and we're ready to do it and we're ready to work. Another way that we spread the gospel is not just through TV or radio or tent meetings or um, debates, but also just through our media. We're known as the free media program. That's what a lot of people describe us as, the free media program. Because everything that we offer, you can order anything from us, any of our debates, any of our material, free of charge. You can order as many DVDs as you would like, and we even pay the shipping and handling costs. We do not charge for any of our materials because we want people to come on there and not have any single barrier for them getting that material. So we do not charge at all. Now we just have a few minutes left and we have about 10 minutes left and um, I want to go ahead and move on to the expansion that we're going to have. We're starting an expansion beginning in June of 2013. What this expansion includes are several things. The first thing that this expansion includes is going, we're going to have a new website. Working on Bible class curriculum for uh, congregations to use. And once again, it's going to be free. We're never going to charge for anything that we do. At least as long as I'm there. And everything is going to be free for the Bible class curriculum. We're doing this for several reasons. A lot of the Bible class curriculum that you can order from places like 21st Century it's not that it's bad, it's just it's not good. And it's very, very elementary in nature. When you have a book that has you read a Bible verse, and it says something about Paul, and then it asks you a question of who did it talk about, and the answer was Paul, you didn't learn a thing. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that right now. That is very shallow, 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 we, we, we teach you that. It is. And I have a bold statement, I don't mind making it. Because we are not ready to go out and to defend the truth against most of us. And that's why we don't do it anymore. We are not equipped to do that. Not because we don't have the truth. No, I'm not saying that. But because we have not studied it and we have not prepared adequately to go out and to defend the truth. Brother, we have got to raise the bar when it comes to the standard of studying the Bible. We've got to raise the bar when it comes to the information that we know so that we can adequately go out and we can defend the truth. And so we're going to be making some Bible class curriculum that is a lot deeper than what people are used to. So that they can study and they can get deep into the Word. Instead of dumbing down the truth for the audience, what we've got to do is we've got to bring the audience up. That's what we have to do. We've done, we've done enough dumbing down right now and watering down. And if you don't believe me, just look at all the different congregations that are sound around the area. They're not growing. They're not growing at all. They're dying. That's what's happening to them. We've got to get out and we've got to We've got to evangelize. We've got to be prepared first, though, if we want to go out and do this. We've got to be ready to do this. So we're going to have the Bible curriculum that we're making. A third thing that we're going to do in this expansion is what we call ETF workshops. And that stands for Equipping, Training, and Fighting. And the purpose of this is to help smaller congregations evangelize in their own area. Most churches of Christ average... Uh, According to the uh, directory, I believe, in 2012, the Church of Christ in the United States, the average um, membership is around 100 um, in, in the Church of Christ in the United States. And you know as well as I do that what's on your membership and what's in the pews every Sunday morning are not the same. You, you know that's the truth, okay? That's everywhere. So the average attendance at each Church of Christ throughout the United States is around approximately 70 members. 70 members is approximately the attendance of the Church of Christ in the United States. Now, most of the smaller congregations are the stronghold. 
They're your older members, they're your more sound members, they're your more dedicated members, but they're dying off left and right. The congregations are dying off left and right. They're thinking, what can we do? What can we do to change things? Uh, you know, if we want to evangelize our community, what can we do? So we want to go in there and we want to help these smaller congregations evangelize their area and to equip them to do that and to help them do that, to help them door knock, but not just door knock, to show them how to discuss the Bible with other people, to give them and equip them with the material so that they can go out and they can do that. And there's several reasons why we want to do this. When you think about lectureships, even good sound lectureships, let's say that there's one that's six hours away from here, and there's two or three families in this congregation that say, hey, this would be good for us to go. We want to get spiritually renewed. This would be a good time to do it. So we go, or you go, and pack up, and you go to this lectureship, and you get excited but there's several problems. Number one, you're going to have to pay maybe a registration fee. You're going to have to pay for travel costs. You're going to have to pay um, for not being at work. And uh, you're going to have to take some time off, which is going to cost you. Whether that's vacation time or whether you're just taking sick days or whatever, you're going to have to take that time off. And you go there and it's very good. You get renewed, but then you come back and you're excited. You can't wait to get things going in the congregation. In three weeks, what happens? All that excitement dies down. Every time, brother, it dies down. That's five minutes, right? So what's the solution to that? Well, here's the solution. Is we've got to get people excited amongst their own congregations. Not go off somewhere else and get excited and come back so that the rest of the congregation can pour that water. We've got to learn how to get excited among ourselves and get that vision of what we want to do among ourselves. I don't know about you, but when I hear people say, boy, it's going to be spiritually renewed, and I love going to this because I get spiritually renewed. I want to be spiritually renewed a whole lot more than one or two times a year. I want to be spiritually renewed every day if I possibly can. I want to be renewed several times a week, not just once or twice a year, because once or twice a year is not going to work. That's like somebody saying, boy, I love working out hard at the gym once or twice a year. It's not going to do you much good doing that. But as a congregation, if we get together and if we're excited and if we see the vision, and if we believe in what we can do, then things will change. So that's where these ETF workshops come in. We want to help these small congregations. And also let them know that we care about them. Let them know that they have somebody and some, some, several Christians they can call, they can rely on. All the resources that we, the Lord's Church, have today in the United States, and we're not using them, we're not coming together. It's pathetic, brethren, the things we could be doing, but the things we are not. We are more, I guess you could say, equipped in the sense of what we have at our fingertips, but we just don't have the knowledge to use it. And we can, but we've got to get together. We've got to get together on this type of stuff, and we've got to believe in it. So those are just some of the things that we have coming up. Now, in the next about three minutes, I want to talk about several things about how you can support this work. We're always looking for financial support through individuals and through congregations. We always are. Uh, but obviously that's not the main thrust. You know, I'm almost done with my speech, and this is the first time I've ever talked about money. We do not solicit from non-Christians. In fact, we do not solicit for money on our programs. This is the only time we do it. And just to members of the church to help us out. And what we're doing is what we call 10 for 10. It's called 10 for 10 because it's $10 for 10 souls. Each DVD that we send out costs us approximately about $1. And we want to send these out to as many people as we can. We send out thousands and thousands of these every single month. And the 10 for 10, the $10 a month, would go for sending out about 10 DVDs. That's what we call 10 for 10, 10 for 10 souls. And I'm going to be passing out some forms. I'm going to wait probably for the assembly hour to pass this around since time's almost up. But if you would like, just put your name and your number, and I'll describe this again when I get up here in a few minutes. If you're interested, and I'll call you give you the form and the information that you need. Now, if you can't do five, or if you can't do ten and you want to do five, that's good too. If you just want to do it a one time, that's fine. We don't complain about ways we get money. <laughs> if, if you want to do more than ten dollars, uh, if you want to do something like, I don't know, hundred thousand dollar donation, that's not going to hurt our feelings either. It's really not. We'll accept that too. Anything that you might could possibly do to help this work, if you believe it. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe in this work, we don't want you. We don't. And I don't say that being mean or ugly. We're not interested in it. We want people who believe in this one to help us out. That's who we're interested in. We're not going to compromise doctrine. We're not going to make you happy. We're not going to tell you 
at some funny source you can laugh and, and just think, oh, Kevin Boyd tells this positive source. No, we're going to teach and preach the counsel of God. And I'm telling you something, we're changing things, folks. We are changing things. But we're going to need the backing and the help of our brethren if we're going to keep changing things to the extent that we possibly can. We're continuing growth. And there's so many things in the works I wish I could tell you more about. But my time's almost out. Another way that you can help this work is by giving me contacts of people that you know at other churches of Christ. And it doesn't have to be just in this area. I literally travel all throughout the United States. If you know members, uh, maybe deacons, elders, family members, whatever it may be, in other parts of the world, in other parts of the country, in other parts of the state, wherever it may be, I would love for you to take their name, give that to me, write it down on a piece of paper, and their number, and that would help me out greatly. Finally, a way that you can help this work is just simply pray. Pray for this work. If you do pray for us, we need all the prayers that we can give. As you know, it's a tough society. It's going to get tough. But we need all the prayers we can get to keep on keeping on. There are any questions as we as we end? There are materials in the back as you walk out. They're on your uh, right hand side. They're all free. There is a donation box if you'd like to put that hundred thousand dollar check in there. You can put it in that box. But uh, all those materials out there, in all seriousness, they are free. And if you can't donate, that's fine. Still feel free to take as much material as you'd like. There's tracks, uh, there's uh, catalogs out there of all of our lessons, and once again, all that material is free. So thank you so much for your time.